I do footnote everything, I am neurotic about that. <laughs> Personal references, you can talk to people around here, they'll tell you how terrible I am. <laughs> so technically today, we are hearing more about prayer. Last week we learned of the widow and her persistence and how that may be more about God's relationship to us and the judge's action to the widow. <clears throat> Today, as the cover suggests, it's about how things in God's kingdom can be reversed from how they appear. Now, <coughs> maybe. It begins with two comments about the addressees, <coughs> who Jesus is talking to. Jesus tells this parable to some who trust themselves and they are righteous and regard others with contempt. Lost it for a minute there. When I first put this in, this thing appeared in Latin. Just jumbled words. So the first verb is used, the verb for those in contempt is used, those who hold themselves up, I should say. The verb is used elsewhere. In a reference to the guy who has armor, the strong man, in which he trusts his armor, but is taken away from him by a stronger man. So to trust in one's own righteousness is to rely on a flimsy defense. One commentator points out that this parable is deceptively simple. I find myself in strong agreement with that statement after reading several commentaries that stand in opposition to each other as to how to interpret this one little paragraph. <coughs> so let's see, who are the players? First we have the Pharisees. The Pharisees of the first century were not legalists so much as they were trying to earn, who were trying to earn God's favor, but they were a Jewish movement that emphasized the importance of the obedience to the law of Moses. Living in accordance with the Torah was a way of making God's benefits visible and accessible to all, in all aspects of life, for all who were Jewish. The Pharisees' attention to things like rituals for cleansing one body or one's cookware was part of a larger effort to encounter God's holiness in everyday life. Pharisaic priorities lie with the notion of Israel as a holy, set-apart nation, even while in the first century Jews lived in subjectation to Roman rule and were dispersed throughout the Mediterranean world. The Pharisees' emphasis on interpreting the law and developing an oral Torah as practical guidelines for law observance helps explain why Jesus had so much interaction with them. He shared similarities with them that led to dialogue, which made some Pharisees sympathetic to the Jesus movement. The similarities also exasperated the differences as Jesus and the Pharisees participated in critical inter-Jewish debates about how exactly Jewish values should express themselves in changing cultural landscape. So that's who the Pharisees are. That's who the Pharisee is in this parable. Then we have the tax collector. The Roman Empire's taxation system repeatedly offended many residents of first century Galilee. It's hard to say how severe the taxation demands were on individuals and their families, but the tax gathering system was notoriously corrupt. And constantly she pops up in many stories. To collect taxes in places like neighborhoods and highways and markets and docks, Roman officials enlisted members of the population to bid for contracts. Tax collectors could line their own pockets with whatever extra they could collect over and above their obligations. This is often why the review in such poor or such contempt because they were members of their own society who appeared to have sided with Rome to make a living. 
the Gospels operate with an understanding that the tax collectors were generally viewed as dishonest and greedy. The reasons are obvious. They were slightly opportunists, as one person says, and collaborators, willing to victimize their own neighbors while assisting the occupiers. They upheld Roman interests at the expense of the people of God. It would have been dangerous to oppose such men who appear to have traded their social conscience and religious self-worth for financial gain. Jesus' willingness to associate with tax collectors he pounds the scandal of his ministry. Why would someone so interested in holiness and liberation spend his time in the company of mobsters? Why would he exchange mercy to those made a living of denying mercy to others? Jesus' delivery reaches out to scoundrels. He does not cast off those who enrich themselves by enabling the empire. So now the scene is set, and the drama is about to play out. Both men head up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, standing by himself, is praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves and rogues and adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all my income. And all I could think of when I read that was, wow, he said that out loud. Those are the thoughts we often keep in our head, but we don't say them out loud. I mean, we all have thoughts, and maybe even paraphrase that go something along those lines. I'm glad I am not him. Thank you for all you have given me. I'm happy to be a contemporary Christian. I'm not like those who preach hate and division. At the same time, the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look towards heaven. Not even dare to cast his eyes upward, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. Broken, humble, knowing that tomorrow he must go back to tax collecting, otherwise, Rome would come looking for him. He would lose his income. His family would end up destitute. Feeling he has no control over anything, he throws his life on the mercy of God. The contrast between the two seems clear and easy, and it is summarized nice and neat. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. It seems rather straightforward. The addressees hear what we expect them to hear, and the Pharisee and the tax collectors play their parts. One challenge for us, perhaps, is to notice that we rather like being exalted. We might think of it as the satisfaction of a job well done or duty fulfilled. And we might begin to believe that things we do, giving money to church, doing religious or charitable activities, being upstanding members of society, make a well-deserved salary, or don't do, being thieves, rogues, or adulterers, really might justify us, at least a little bit might make us a bit better than those who fail where we succeed. Paul Tillich, commenting on Apostle Paul's assertion that the gospel is a stumbling block, once said that the danger is stumbling over the wrong thing. This is one of those parables, you see. We often usually make the assumption that I have laid out for you. It is easy to judge the Pharisees. We know who they are and how they are viewed. But if you heard my faux pas earlier, you would see how easy it is to become the Pharisee, even in reflection of the gospel. Lord, we thank you that we are not like the other people, hypocrites, overtly pious, self-righteous, or even like that Pharisee. We come to church each week. We listen attentively to scripture, and we have learned that we should be only to be humble. I am so proud that I am humble. Or what was that song? Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Uh, Natalie, you want to come back up here? <laughs> <laughs> in order to avoid the kind of self congratulatory meaning <coughs> of the parable that the parable itself would seem to condemn, it may help to know that, in fact, everything the Pharisee says is true. He's not lying. 
He has set himself apart from others by his faithful adherence to the law. He is, by the standards both Luke and Jesus seem to employ, righteous. So before we judge him too quickly, we might reframe his prayer slightly and wonder if we have uttered it ourselves. Maybe we haven't said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. But what about of seeing someone down on their luck? There but for the grace of God go on. It isn't that the Pharisee is speaking falsely, but rather the Pharisee misses the true nature of his blessings. The issue is, the Pharisee is trusting in his own actions. He is self-justifying his own righteousness and his prayer. His conversation with God is all about, well, himself. The tax collector, on the other hand, knows that he possesses no means by which to claim righteousness. He has done nothing of merit. Indeed, he has done much to offend the law of Israel. And for this reason, he stands back, hardly daring to approach the temple, and throws himself on the mercy of the Lord. The tax collector is relying on God. One commentator says, he is not so much as a humble, but desperate. He is too overwhelmed by his plight to take time to divide humanity into sides. That's a grace he doesn't have the time for. All he recognizes is that he stands near the temple is his own great need. He therefore stakes his hopes and his claims, not on anything he has done or deserved, but entirely on the mercy of God. I don't think it's an accident that this exchange takes place at the temple. On the grounds of the temple, you are always intimately aware of who you were, of what status you had, and what you could expect from God. There were, at the temple, insiders and outsiders. And according to these rules, there was no question of where the Pharisee and the tax collector stood. But when Jesus dies, all this changes. As the Gospels report, the curtain in the temple is torn in two, symbolically erasing all divisions of humanity before God. That act is prefigured here, as God justifies not the one favored by temple law, but rather the one standing outside the temple gate, and aware only of his utter need. The parable is a tricky one, for as soon as we feel contempt for the Pharisee and his truthful prayer, we divide. As soon as we are confused by the tax collector who gets to go home justified, to go on with his life, we divide. And as soon as we fall into the trap of dividing humanity into any type of groups, we have aligned with the Pharisee. Whether our division is between righteous and sinners, as with the Pharisee, or even between the self-righteous and the humble, as with Luke, we are doomed. Anytime we draw a line between who's in and who's out, the parable asserts you will find God on the other side. Once we read the parable this way, the parable breaks forth from its traditional interpretation. This is not about being self-righteous. This is not about being humble. This is not about a tax collector nor a Pharisee. This is about God. There's something new. God who alone can judge. God alone who knows it, what lies upon the human heart. God alone who is loving and forgiven. God who can grant justice even unto the unjust. In the end, the Pharisee will leave the temple and return to his home righteous. This hasn't changed. He was righteous when he came up, and righteous as he goes back down. The tax collector, however, will leave the temple and go back down to his home justified. That is, accounted righteous by the Holy One of Israel. And how has this happened? The tax collector makes neither sacrifice nor restitution. On what basis? How then? Is he named righteous? On the basis of God's own fiat and ordinance. In biblical terms, because God has deemed it so, just because, 
In theological terms, as we proclaim in all loving God, so stands a lowly tax collector, righteous in God's sight. For you who have loved Jesus, perhaps the great passion and protectiveness, do you recognize that any God worthy of the name must transcend the creeds and denominations and time and place and nation and ethnicities and all the barriers of gender and sexual orientation extending to the limits of all we can see, suffer, and enjoy. You are not your gender. You are not your nationality. You are not your ethnicity, your skin color, or your social class. These are not the qualities of your true self and God. Why, oh why, do Christians allow temporary costumes, or what Thomas Merton called the false self, to pass for the substantial self, which is always hidden with Christ in God? It seems often that we really do not know our own gospel. You are a child of God and always will be, even when you don't believe it. As I said in the beginning, same quote. And so it is with everyone else. God created us all. We are all God's children. And the most frustrating thing to do is to stand next to the one that you're really fighting their policies or their positions and thinking, you're not right with God. It's hard to break down division that have been on our heart for so long. As we stand in this revelation of our true selves and the extravagant love of God, we forget that only for a moment our human constructive divisions. And we can stand before God aware of only our need. And in that moment, we too can be justified. Oftentimes, it takes a pause a strong and long pause, especially if we're active people who sometimes stand on one side of a picket line while somebody else is on the other side of the street of the road. I like to remind people oftentimes we work better as river against a stone, walking beside people in our commonalities and talking about the loving God that we know and understand. That we can do when standing with picket lines. I'm not saying they're not necessary. I'm just saying sometimes the journey is much like the road to the banks. Having a conversation and somebody discovering that God is right there among us. Then too, we are all humble. Then we too can be justified by God and Jesus and invited to return to our homes in mercy and grace and gratitude.